Avinu Markeno and Nakta Modim Lahab Bishul Kora Brohotu and Nakta Kibana Memha. Anna Adonai, Bechas Decha, Tiftaka, Ten Amshirano, the Federal Child Varecha. The Bechas Decha, Avagam Ken Ten Lano, Hachov Mabe, and Merit's Low Rakishma, Avagam Ken Lassor, the Fima Shekatu Bedrecha. Beshem Yeshua Hamashiach, Adonai no Golen of its Katino. Heavenly Father, we come before you thankfully once again and prayerfully, asking that you would open our eyes to your word, to its meaning, its glory. <coughs> And as always, we beseech you for wisdom and courage to be not only those who hear, but those who do, in your grace, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've been looking at the book of Ezekiel. Tonight we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 24. Chapter 4 follows chapter 23, where he does a comparison of Israel and Judah, the ten northern tribes who'd completely gone astray, and who failed to listen to the prophecies of Hosea and Amos and went into the Assyrian captivity in 721 BC and he calls them Ohola, Ohola, the tent of tabernacle but he calls Judah the ones who had the house of David Oholiba, Oholiba my tabernacle, my tent is in her because they had the holy ark. But he begins using the analogy of seduction to explain the spiritual seduction that happened to Judah. Judah became as bad and as corrupt as Israel. Now the last days the same thing happens. Spiritual seduction happens not only to Israel but to the church. Previously the people would have thought We've got the Holy Ark, we're the faithful Jews, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, the Levites, and the refugees from up north who came south in the revival of King Asa, we're the faithful Israel. Those other ten tribes that have turned to idolatry, they're unfaithful. We're Judah, they're Israel. Much the same as perhaps 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we would have seen the evangelical church, the born-again church, and the others. <clears throat> A generation ago, when born-again Christians said something like the apostate church or Babylon, it was understood in popular Christian colloquialism that when you said apostate church or Babylon or something like that, you were talking about the church of Rome or liberal Protestants or Eastern Orthodoxy or a cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Well, it gets to the point where evangelicism becomes just as corrupt as everything else. And that's what's basically happened. What transpired before the Babylonian captivity is what happens before Babylon the Great. That is the background of chapter 23. But tonight we're looking at what follows it. What comes next? What should we expect to happen in the next 10 to 12 years if the Lord has not returned? What is going to happen broadly speaking, to the church, at least in the Western world, in the developed world, what's going to happen in the next 10 to 12 years if the Lord has not returned? What is the immediate to midterm future going to look like for us? For you, for me, your family, my family, this church, my church in, in England, where Bill will be speaking in a few weeks, what is it going to be like in the next 10 to 12 years? I say this cautiously. But I'm quite convinced this is the way it's going to be. What comes next? What comes once Oholiba becomes as bad as Ohola? What comes once evangelicism has been discredited? What should we expect to happen? What kind of environment are our children going to grow up in? What kind of church and society, post-Christian society, should we prepare our children to confront? in the next 10 to 12 years. With these things in view, begin with me please to Ezekiel 34. As we pointed out last night, and as we always remind ourselves, Ezekiel is the only one other than Jesus called Son of Man. Like all Israel's prophets, he is again a type of Christ, but he's a type of Christ eschatologically. He's called Son of Man. We have one anominate character in Daniel who's called Son of Man, but that was a Christophany of Jesus. Other than Jesus, Ezekiel is the only one called Son of Man. And like all Israel's prophets, he prophesies for three time frames. For his own time, the events following 585, 586 BC, 
He prophesies for the first coming of Jesus, and he prophesies for the return of Jesus. He prophesies for three different time frames, sometimes all in the same breath, even in all in the same verse. Again, it's the most eschatological book from a literary perspective in the Old Testament. Every chapter in Revelation alludes to, or draws from, or quotes, or cites something from the book of Ezekiel. It's the most eschatological book as a whole, and it is a book that gives us the most insight into the millennium. Although there are the passages of Isaiah and so forth, which do likewise, Ezekiel has the most. By Ezekiel's day, it was a situation like this. The rejected prophets who warned them about Babylon and warned them about the way they were going were all rejected yet vindicated. Micah was proven right. Isaiah was proven right. Although King Manasseh sought Isaiah in half. Joel was proven right. Jeremiah and Baruch were proven right. They were all proven right. The false prophets like Hananiah and the others were all proven wrong but it still made no difference. Even after Jeremiah and Isaiah and Micah and Joel were proven right, the people still continued to follow false prophets anyway. All their promises of victory and revival never happened. It was obvious they prophesied falsely, but the people would just jump on the next bandwagon and believe the next lie. Well, that sounds very much like our time, doesn't it? The last days are the same. Babylon begins to encroach. This is what it's going to be like in the next 10 to 12 years. Let's begin. And the word of the Lord came to me in verse 1, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth of the month, saying, The word of the Lord came. As I always point out, the word is logos in Greek, mamra in Aramaic, davar in Hebrew. Who is the Logos? Jesus. Jesus came to me. Remember, it's an encounter with Christ. It's an encounter with the living word, the person. It's not a message. False prophets will always give you a word. True prophets will always point you to the word. You see these guys going around, I have a word, the Lord gave me a word, I have a word. That is not prophecy, it is clairvoyance. That is not how biblical prophecy works. Any kind of prophetic revelation that God gives to a true prophet or a prophetess will always be scripturally based, will always point to Jesus in some way, will always, always meet that criteria. The true prophets of God didn't go around having visions and pictures every five minutes. But when they did get them, they were true. When they had a prediction, it happened, and it was always biblical based. Always. It's not like what most of we have today. The word of the Lord came. He had an encounter with the Lord himself by the Spirit. Now the date, there's a superscription, we'll come to that in a moment, saying, Son of man, write the name, <clears throat> write the name of the day, this very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem, this very day. The king of Babylon, turn with me please to the book of Isaiah chapter 14, Ishayahu. I apologize to those who know this, but for the sake of the recording, we have to go through it. The king of Babylon is coming. Verse 4, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, how the oppressor has ceased, how the fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the peoples in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you, the cedars of Lebanon. Remember, when Jesus healed the blind man, he saw them walking as trees. He saw men walking as trees. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bear good fruit. The trees of the field will clap their hands. This is speaking metaphorically. Since you were laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. There'll be no more persecution of God's people. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead. All the leaders of the earth, it raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They will all respond and say to you, even 
you have become weak as we. You've become like us. On the tape, the recording, the judgment of Satan, we deal with this. In the judgment of Satan, he will be perpetually mocked. Jesus, the King of Kings, was mocked on the cross. Come down from there. Save yourself. You did these miracles. You're the Son of God. You say you're the Messiah. Come on, save yourself. Jesus was publicly ridiculed. The King of Kings was ridiculed. Well, Satan will be ridiculed for all eternity. Part of his judgment will be his ridicule, but let's continue to look at this. Straight out of the book of Daniel, virtually, verse 11, Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. Now look at this in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit, etc. Who wants to ascend above God? Who wants to be worshipped in place of God? Obviously, the king of Babylon is a metaphor for Satan. But more than that, the recesses of the north. You've heard me say, Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, the city of our God, the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the recesses of the north, the city of the great king, as Jesus was God who came in a human form, Satan will dwell antichrist. He will enter the temple of God, the tribulational temple of Revelation 11, as we see the prediction of Jesus in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, the Shikut Sameshumem. We see in <coughs> the Second Thessalonians, Satan will come in a human form to the person of antichrist, counterfeiting the incarnation of Jesus. He will come in <coughs> and he will attempt to ascend above the heights of the clouds and make himself like the most high he wants to be worshipped. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. Now look at verse 12, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. In Hebrew it is almost, almost the same as the bright and morning star. Antichrist will attempt to look like Christ. We see this in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist comes followed by his horsemen. Revelation 21, Jesus comes on a white horse, followed by his horsemen. Antichrist is always trying to preempt Christ, counterfeit Christ, mimic Christ, but even pre-mimic Christ. We see this in Revelation chapter 6, when the Antichrist comes and he's followed by the ashen horse, the red horse, and the black horse. Well, Jesus comes on, the white, on a white horse as well, but then he's followed by the saints on the white horses coming with him. They both, of course, come to bring war, but Jesus comes to bring war in order to establish peace. Antichrist comes to bring war in order to bring more war. He tries to look like the real thing. The king of Babylon was coming, and the king of Babylon is coming again. This is the Antichrist, Satan, as it were, incarnate. He's coming. Now it may be, and I say this with a big caveat, I'm not saying it dogmatically, but there must be a reason, or there is a reason, for the superscription beyond history. The date in which <clears throat> Ezekiel was told to name the date the king of Babylon is coming, there will be a specific day in which the Antichrist will be revealed. There will be many Antichrists. Which one is the Antichrist? There'll be a number of treaties in the Middle East, but which one will be the one? Okay. There will be a specific day, a time and place, when these things will be revealed, and it may have to do with this date. I'm not saying it does. I'm simply saying it's a possibility we should take into account. Not to know the day of the Lord's return, but to know the time of the revelation of who the Antichrist is. The tenth month, <clears throat> the tenth of the month, saying, Son of man, write the name 
of the day, this very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem. That may be the day when the Antichrist will take his place in the temple of God and set up the abomination. And speak a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Put on the pot, put it on. Also pour water in it. When you see that repeated language, put on the pot, put it on, that is a poetic device of repetition frequently used in eschatological passages of Scripture. When you see that kind of repetition, that is a hint that the context has some future eschatological meaning. Put on the pot, put it on. Pour water in it. Put in it pieces, every good piece, the thigh, the shoulder. Fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest of the flock and also pile wood under the pot. Make it boil vigorously. Also seethe its bones in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot in which there is rust, and whose rust has gone out of it. Take out of it piece after piece without making a choice. For her blood is in her midst. She placed it on the bare rock. She did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust. That it may cause wrath to come up and take vengeance. I put her blood on the bare rock that it may not be covered. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, woe to the bloody city. I shall also make the pile great. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, boil the flesh well, and mix in the spices, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty on its coals, so that it may be hot, and its bronze <coughs> may glow, and its filthiness may be melted in it, its rust consumed. She has wearied me with toil, yet her great rust has not gone from her. Let her rust be in the fire. In your filthiness is lewdness, because I would have cleansed you, you are not clean. You will not be cleansed from your filthiness again until I've spent my wrath on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. It is coming and I shall act. I shall not relent. I shall not pity. I shall not be sorry according to your ways and according to your deeds. I shall judge you, declares the Lord God. Let's begin at the beginning. The idea of the blood. The blood was not poured on the ground. For Jewish meat to be kosher, it has to be ritually slaughtered. There could be no cruelty to the animal. The blood was not to be consumed. Life was in the blood. Now this even has ramifications for Christians in the New Testament. Christians were not obligated to keep Mosaic law except for four provisions. One of them is the consumption of blood. The ramifications of this for the Roman Catholic abomination of the mass are obvious because they believe the wine is transubstantiated into protoplasmic blood into hemoglobin of Jesus Christ, and then they drink it ritually after he dies again sacrificially. For sin, the blood is consumed in a vampire ritual called the Mass. This is cannibalism. It is openly forbidden. It is an abomination. If it is real transubstantiation, if transubstantiation was real, which it isn't, but even if it was, they should not be drinking it. According to Acts 15, <clears throat> this was a serious business. Her blood is in her midst. She placed it on the bare rock. She did not pour it on the ground. Now he's alluding to the bloody city because of the abominations that took place in it. There had been human sacrifice of babies to demons. There had been persecution of the true prophets. It was a bloody city. But let's understand what it's talking about. A very brief lesson in Hebrew and then back to high school chemistry. Today we can coat our skillets and pots with Teflon. Teflon was of course invented for the American space program, but then it became a consumer durable. Now they have this crushed diamonds and ceramic material that's even better than Teflon. We plate our cooking vessels with Teflon. In the scriptures they did not have that. What they had was, it's just after the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. Barzel, then the Bronze Age. Nachoshet. Iron and copper or brass, it's the same word. Remember the Nahushtan, the brass serpent that Moses lifted up? 
that the wilderness, the nechushtan nechoshet, nechoshet. What they would do is plate, in their primitive metallurgy, they would plate the iron with copper or brass. That was as far as they had. They had the Iron Age, then they went into the Bronze Age, but that's as far as they went. They didn't have advanced alloys or anything of that nature. Well, it says it rusts. When something is being oxidized, something else is being reduced. Simple chemistry, simple physiology. When something's being oxidized, something else is always being reduced. If you eat, you're killing yourself. Because in order to convert energy, uh, convert food to energy, carbon to energy requires oxygen. It works in Krebs cycle. Adenine triphosphate reacted in Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, oxalosacinic malic, etc., yields ADP, adenine biphosphate, plus energy, plus inorganic phosphate, or so they taught me in university and my way with youth, but this takes oxygen. Eating will kill you. Not eating will kill you quicker. Breathing will kill you. Respiration is lethal. That oxygen is deadly. Breathing will kill you. Not breathing will kill you quicker. This is bioentropy. It's a result of the fall of man. The entropy came in because of sin. So what happens? Iron reacted with heat. In the gaseous state, in vapor state, Iron oxide. If a welder doesn't wear a protective apparatus, he's an ultra high candidate for emphysema within 15 years. <laughs> it's dangerous. You react to iron, you oxidize it, you're going to get iron oxide gas. When it goes into water, it's actually B peroxide, B3 in water. Well, how does this come about? Before the age of Microbiology, God knew something about microbes. He knew that bacteria could cause oxidation. <laughs> it could cause metal to corrode. And so the cooking vessels were covered with a film of bacteria. Greasy, slimy. Uh, he compares it to a cooking vessel, a pot or a skillet that wasn't properly cleaned. And he's trying to clean it. No, you won't clean it. Clean it, you won't clean it. And of course, this bacterial film is causing it to corrode. It's being oxidized. This goes on and on. And you begin getting little specks, shavings of iron particles. <laughs> and this goes on and on. And they refuse to clean it. They refuse to clean it. God says, let me clean it. No, I'm not going to let you clean it. And it just takes on, it gets worse and worse and worse, it gets filthier and filthier, and oxidation increases, it gets rustier and rustier, and the corrosion becomes an amplified condition. <laughs> so God says, all right, you want the filth? You want corrosion? We're going to turn up the heat. Bring some coal. Bring some charcoal wood. Make it brazen hot and pour boiling water into the pot. So the boiling water will catalyze the corrosion. And more and more iron particles will go into the boiling water. We'll turn up the heat, I'll make it worse, I'll make it even more contaminated. That's what you want? No problem, I'll make it hotter. No, we'll make it even more hot. Let the rust go into the pot. Then get the good meat. Go down to the kosher butcher, get the best cuts of meat you can get. Hips, joints, whatever. Chop it up and throw it in. Well, what happens to the meat? Obviously, the iron, the iron particles osmosify 
into the muscle tissue. <laughs> now you've got poison meat. He says, put in good meat. It doesn't matter how good it is when you put it in. When you pull it out, it's poison. This is not the same situation that Elisha faced. Elisha faced the situation of toxic stew. He faced a situation where the content of the pot was poison. This is not a situation where the content of the pot is poison. This is a situation where the pot itself is poison. A religious system becomes so backslidden that it's not what's in it that's wrong. The system itself, the container itself, is irreparably, irredeemably contaminated. And anything you put into it is going to get contaminated. When the content of the pot was contaminated, when it was a toxic stew, it was a solution. Throw grain in. True doctrine can absorb the toxicity out of the content. Right doctrine can correct error. You can throw grain into a poison stew and it will make it edible once you're just dealing with poison stew that's in the pot. Now you're dealing with a poison pot. There is no solution anymore. And it gets to the point where God says, I wanted to clean this film off of it, I wanted to get rid of the bacteria, I wanted to scrub this stuff. I told you, you should have listened to Micah, you should have listened to Isaiah, you should have listened to Joel, you should have listened to Jeremiah and Baruch, I wanted to scrub this stuff, but you just kept persecuting those guys and killing them and ignoring them. And let more and more of this bacterial film accumulate. Well, since that's what you want, no problem. Now I'm going to turn up the heat. Now I'll make it oxidize even faster. Now the iron particles are going to go into the boiling water. It's no longer a poison stew, it's a poison pot. Throw the meat in! Choice meat, the best you can get! It doesn't matter how much good you put in. It's coming out bad. It's Matthew 23. You go to the ends of the earth to make one proselyte. And he becomes twice as much a son of hell as he used to be, Jesus said. They will try to tell you, well, what about all the good things and the good people? What about the people being saved? We know the answer. He never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. How are you going to make a disciple in a wicked place like that? Saved into what? It might be good when you put it in, but it's coming out bad. There's no other possibility. The iron is going to osmosify into whatever was good. It will become inedible. And if you do eat it, you're going to get sick, very sick. They'll always tell you, what about the people being saved and what about the good? <laughs> We're way past that. Well, we have to stay in and pray and try to bring them the truth. We're way past that. That might have been true 25, 30 years ago. Not now. It's not a poison stew anymore. 25 years ago, the stew began to get poison. We're way past that. Now the pot itself is poison. One movement after another. I live in Great Britain and America's going the same way. Every major Protestant denomination, the Anglicans, Church of England, here you call them Episcopalians, ordaining homosexuals. Methodists, ordaining homosexuals. Presbyterians, ordaining homosexuals. United Reformed Church, ordaining homosexuals. It's just that one issue. It's coming here. It's getting worse and worse and worse. The film gets worse and worse and worse. 
Now the Lord gave them warning. He tried to clean the film. He tried to scrub the bacterial plaque off of the metallic surface. There were people, you could go back to what, you know, it, it, it would have seemed impossible at the time they said it. But what you see happening now, you can go back and read what Tozer wrote in the 1940s and 50s. When he wrote that stuff in the 40s and 50s, it would have seemed unthinkable that it could happen. But it happened like he said. I remember as a young believer, when I got saved in the early 1970s, Francis Schaeffer warned what was going to happen to the church at the end of the 20th century. He wrote a book. If you keep going this way, this is what's going to happen. It didn't seem realistic at the time. It was the Jesus movement, and there was a move of God among the hippies and all of this. It didn't seem like it could be. But it happened just the way he said it was going to happen. They didn't listen to Tozer or to Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer's own son is a backslider. Went into the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now he's just gone into apparently godlessness. Attacking his old man. It's unbelievable. The film gets worse and worse. So what does God say? All right, that's it. If that's what you want. I'll give it to you. I'm going to turn the heat up. I'm going to make it oxidize even faster. Turn up the heat! You understand it's gone beyond the point of no return now. No amount of good you put into it is going to make a difference. No amount of grain you put into it is going to detoxify it. It's gone beyond that now. It's under the judgment of God. You look at these people, what they're doing. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Again, I hate to beat the same guy over the head, but just just look at, at, at Rick Warren. Chris Lamb, and he, he co-authors the book, The Emergent Church. He co-forwards it with Dan Kimball, with, with Brian McLaren. This is neo-Gnosticism. This is postmodernism. And this Chris Lamb, and then the whole oh, one thing after another gets worse and worse. They're listening to people that are just crazy. Piper, I warned about Piper years ago. Now he's a cheerleader for Warren. Doesn't surprise me. Mark Driscoll, this is what they're following. People who do not seem to even care what the Word of God says. That's where they're reading things like the message. <laughs> it's unbelievable. The new edition of the New International Version is going to be gender neutral. It gets worse and worse. Turn up the heat. So what does God say once the pot becomes so contaminated it's irredeemable. Let's begin in verse 15. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I'm about to take from you the desire of your eyes with a blow. But you shall not mourn, you shall not weep, your tears shall not come. Groan silently. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban. Put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your mustache. Do not eat the bread of men. This is referring to ancient Near Eastern um, mourning rituals. We say hit the bell in Hebrew, mourning rituals. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. And in the morning I did as I was commanded. A prophet of God, if he's a real prophet of God like Ezekiel, must be identified both with the Lord and with the people he's prophesying to. Nobody in their right mind would want that job. You've heard me say it before. If somebody goes around claiming to be a prophet, the odds are 99 to 1 they're a false one. No real prophet wants that job. Who wants this? 
because as far as God was concerned, the desire of his eyes, Hetzibah, Israel, my delight is in her, Hetzibah, was dead. Dead spiritually, dead morally. Ezekiel had to experience God's pain. The one he loved and cared about, the delight of his eyes was now dead. And God tells him, I'm going to take from you the desire of your eyes with the blow. Groan silently. Keep your misery, your sense of loss, your bereavement to yourself. Keep it a very private matter. Let no one see you grieve. Don't go to the funeral. Don't sit shiver. Don't go to the burial. Don't grieve. Don't mourn. Nothing. Let people see you just don't care. It's like that guy who paid a scalper $2,000 for a ticket to the Super Bowl. And he got the ticket and he went in with his binoculars because he was way, way up. And he's looking through the binoculars and he sees an empty seat right on the 50 yard line. He said, what's this? Oh, I got nothing to lose. I'll go down and see. So just before kickoff, he goes down and he says that a person sitting next to a part of me says, anyone sitting here? And the guy says, oh, no. How did this happen? Well, it was for my wife. We attended the last 34 Super Bowls together. Every one, we never missed one. But then my wife died and she couldn't make this one. He said, I'm sorry for your loss. Why didn't you give the ticket to a relative? He says, I couldn't. They're all at the funeral. <laughs> you have other priorities. You pretend as if you just don't care, Ezekiel. Let the people see you're not going to the funeral. Let everyone see you're not mourning, you're not grieving, you're not weeping. Not going to sit shiver. Let everyone see your wife is dead and you just don't care. Let everyone see you don't care. So I spoke to the people in the morning. In the evening, my wife died. In the morning, I did as I was commanded. And the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things that you're doing mean for us? Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm about to profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, and the delight of your soul. And your sons and your daughters whom you have left behind will fall by the sword. And you'll do as I've done. You will not cover your mustache. You will not eat the bread of men. Your turbans will be on your heads. Your shoes on your feet, you will not mourn, you will not weep, but you will rot away in your iniquities, and you will groan to one another. Thus Ezekiel will be assigned to you according to all he has done, you will do. When it comes, then you will know that I am the Lord. When they ask you why you don't care, <laughs> say you're not going to care either. It's not worth it anymore. But your wife is dead. I don't care. You going to the funeral? No, I'm going bowling with the guys. But it's your wife. Big deal. But it means nothing to you? Nah, she means nothing to me. Are you going to bury the corpse? Somebody else do it. I'm busy. I just don't care. I just don't care. What a thing. He just doesn't care. The Assemblies of God in this country beginning with Pensacola, slit its own throat. 
is committing suicide. Who cares? Let her die. The Protestant denominations, most of them were founded in Britain and Europe by martyrs. Look at them now. Same-sex marriage, God knows what else. Oh, they're declining quickly. Their numbers are going down. In Great Britain, where the Methodists began, they closed one church a week. The Muslims opened one mosque a week. Oh, but this is the heritage of John Wesley. Who cares? Let the Methodists drop dead. The Lutherans, let them drop dead. You know, what's going to happen to the church? <laughs> Somebody get a shovel. Don't bother me. I got no time for it. I have other priorities. More pressing interests. Let her drop dead. National Association of Evangelicals. Drop dead. No better than the World Council of the Churches. Drop dead. But don't you care what's happened to the church? Can't you see? It's declining that the country is becoming new age and Islam is growing throughout the Western world, especially Europe. And that's going to come here now and what's going to do it? Look what it says. You're going to lose your sons and daughters. <laughs> the world will always have better rock concerts. <laughs> Once you use entertainment to draw people, you're going to have to use entertainment to keep people. And the world will always put on a better show. Every time, the world's going to do it better. All of these programs are youth-focused, but they're entertainment-based. They're not building up the youth. They're not preparing the youth for the future. They're conning them with lies and entertaining them. They're imitating the world. They're going to lose their sons and daughters. But look how the death happens. Verse 23, you will rot away. Again, I come to this country with a British eye. The things that happened in Britain 25 years ago are happening in America now, 25, 30 years ago. You're going to rot to death. These movements are going to rot to death. Once Chuck Smith is not around, I can see many Calvary chapels going the same way. They're going to go away from what they originally believed. The same as the Methodists, same as the Brethren, same as the Baptists. I spoke in a Grace Brethren, what used to be a conservative Brethren church in Ohio a few weeks ago. They're going completely off the rails. They're going to rot to death. The numbers will go down. The youth will wander off. They'll close this church, they'll close that church. They don't cave in overnight. They just rot with gangrene. They rot with cancer. They rot with necrosis. They just rot to death. And once they're dead, don't even go to the funeral. Don't mourn for the bride. If Jesus Christ doesn't care, why should we? If Jesus no longer cares, why should we? Now, I'm not saying there are not faithful people in those churches. I'm not saying that there are not good churches in these bad denominations. I'm not saying that there are not independent congregations that are faithful. There are faithful people. There are even some faithful congregations. But more and more people are meeting in homes and small groups because they can't find the church that's faithful anymore. Let them die. Let them die. 
You look at it. How can somebody begin a broadcasting enterprise with the contribution of Christians? 700 people giving $10 a month in the beginning. You build it into a network, sell it to Rupert Murdoch and pocket the money. Pulling it off legal, it's... <laughs> I'm only stating a fact. I was in Los Angeles last week. Every day the front page had a featured article on the scandals in TBN. They, their own granddaughter saying that they stole $160 million that she knows of. $160 million! Private jets, God knows who. Oh, TBN's in trouble! Let it drop dead! The first mega church, the first one. Hybels and all these guys in Warren, they all imitate who? Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral. The Catholics just bought it for a song. It's closed down, 56 million in debt. The Crystal Cathedral is closing down, it's 56 million in debt. Who cares? Let it drop dead. It's not worth crying over. But Jim and Tommy, they had such a big ministry. Let it drop dead. Jesus doesn't care anymore. It's a harlot wife. It's a harlot bride. He just doesn't care. Neither should we. In fact, we've reached the point where he exasperates their decline. Turn up the heat. And when she snuffs it, don't shed a single tear, she's not worth it. But then what? Okay, we see this is beginning to happen. It certainly happened in Europe already. Now it's coming here. Verse 25. As for you, son of man, will it not be on the day when I take from them the stronghold, their stronghold, the joy of their pride, the desire of their eyes, their heart's delight, their sons and daughters, is going to take their heart's delight, <laughs> like their buildings, the Crystal Cathedral. That was a monument to a man. It was built in praise of the legacy of Norman Vincent Peale. And their sons and daughters. That on that day, he who escapes will come to you with information for your ears. On that day, your mouth will be opened to him who escaped. You will speak and be dumb no longer. Thus you will be assigned to them and they will know I am the Lord. You will be dumb no longer. This harkens back to what God told Ezekiel at the beginning of his ministry. Look with me please very briefly to Ezekiel chapter 3. Verse 26, moreover, I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth, so that you will be dumb and cannot be a man who rebukes them, for they are a rebellious house. You see, you can't tell these people. They have a spirit of error. You can show them demonstrably, irrefutably, categorically, what they're doing, what they're teaching is not scriptural. You can prove it to them. But you may as well talk to the wall. You cannot rebuke them, you cannot correct them, you're like dumb. A time will come though, when God will open your mouth, and they will listen. But it will be too late. Look what it says again. 
This is the future. Verse 25. I'll take from them the stronghold, the joy of their pride, the desire of their eyes, their heart's delight. Jim and Tommy lost it, Shula lost it, TBN's losing it. Payday comes for all of them. Not all at once, they rot. That on that day, he who escapes will come to you with information for your ears. On that day, your mouth will be opened to him who escapes. There are people in those churches. There are people in those denominations. There are even pastors in those denominations who will escape. Some of the people in these churches were saved in them. It was all they ever knew. It was all they were ever taught was ever. Nobody ever taught them exegesis. Nobody ever expounded the scriptures in context. Nobody ever taught them right doctrine. Many of them do not even have a proper understanding of the gospel itself. <coughs> But if they love the Lord, the Holy Spirit is going to show them. Get out of here. This thing is going down, and it's going down quick. Get out of here. It always goes to Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. How many people here used to be in these nut job churches, and the Holy Spirit showed you to get out? Put your hand up. Look around. Why are you here tonight? Because by the grace of God, you escaped. Amen. People are going to be dismayed, confused. How can the great vision of the Crystal Cathedral come to nothing? Or the TBN come to nothing? Or this, or that, or that other one, that Ted, whatever his name was, the off with the drugs, Ted Haggard. How could it? They're going to be confused. They're going to escape, and they're going to come to you with information. Yeah, we know. <laughs> We've known that for some time. We've been trying to tell you those things for some time. Welcome to the club. As we say in England, now the proverbial penny has dropped. Now you get it. Now you see what we saw five years ago, ten years ago. Yeah, come on in, you've come to the right place. Those who escape. It's no longer about those who remain. Turn up the heat. It's only about those who escape. They're going to walk through that door. They're going to be the victims of spiritual abuse. They're going to be confused. They're going to be almost unbelievably ignorant of biblical doctrine. And they're going to come in here looking for people who understand and looking for answers. Jesus wants you to be here for them. That is the future. Those places are going down. Independent churches, house churches, these things are hard to quantify. And when persecution comes, and it is coming, guess which kind of churches are going to survive? The Holy Spirit is building another kind of church. But something I've been very concerned with for years and have tried to highlight for years is this. The ethos, the focus cannot be they're getting it wrong. 
This church and other churches like it cannot be a refugee camp for people who were born, burned in bad churches. Yes, you have to be here for them. You have to pick up the survivors. You have to help these people. They need encouragement. They need fellowship. They need counseling. They need a lot of things. Above all, they need instruction in the scriptures. But the philosophy has to be, they're getting it wrong, we've got to get it right. They're doing bad evangelism, false evangelism. We've got to do scriptural evangelism. They're not doing biblical discipleship. We have to do biblical discipleship. They're not expounding the scripture. They're doing motivational speaking with Christian jargon. We have to expound the scripture. It has to be, they're getting it wrong. We've got to get it right. We can't be an introspective self-help group for people who were burned in bad churches. Yet we have to be here for those who escaped. But the church has been so discredited. Society is so postmodern. How do you evangelize them? Jesus told us the gospel of the kingdom. I've been saying that for years. Use end time prophecy to engage people evangelistically. That's why we made the Daniel Project. We've had a number of people saved around the world just watching it. Show it in your house. Bring unsaved people, neighbors, friends, relatives. Just get them to watch it. They all want to know the future. They all know the world is heading for some kind of cataclysm and the Middle East has something to do with it. You'd have to be a stupid person not to recognize that. We've got to get on with it. Warren is saying, avoid end time prophecy. We have to be using end time prophecy to see people saved. They are about the past. We are about the future. They are about those who are going to die. We are about those who escape. They have no future other than rotting to death, other than losing their youth. We must keep our youth few as they may be. Never despise the day of small things. The Lord spends a long time getting the foundation right. Remember, many times I've told people, we are far better off being part of something that is growing slowly than we are being a part of something that is dying quickly. It is rotting to death. It's no longer about them, it's about those who escape from them, as we did. It's the boiling pot. It's no longer the contaminated content of the pot. Now, it's the contaminated pot itself. They refuse to be cleansed. Even after their prophecies fail to materialize, they'll believe the next lie. Just like in Ezekiel's day. Even though the revival doesn't come, they'll jump on board with the next fatter gimmick. Just like in Ezekiel's day. So the Lord says, that's it. That's what you want. Turn up the heat. The moral issue alone how can people, pastors, stay in denominations that are compromising on homosexual marriage? How can people compromise with unscriptural divorce and remarriage among believers and let them take the Lord's Supper? Just the moral issues alone. Turn up the heat. The bride is dying. They closed the Crystal Cathedral. TBN is in the hole. It's getting in trouble. Just look at the LA Times. Oh, this is a disaster. 
Who cares? God doesn't. Jesus doesn't care anymore. Let her drop dead. If he doesn't care, we shouldn't either. That's the reality. That's the future. If the Lord does not return, that's the way it's going to be for us for the next 10 to 12 years. Beyond that, we're just beginning to see more dimly what's coming after that. But for the next 10, 12 years or so, the pot is going to boil. That's the way it was in the days of Ezekiel. The king of Babylon was coming. They are being set up for the Antichrist. The king of Babylon is coming. There's no stopping it now. I'm not just talking about a sick society that you can't stop. I'm talking about a sick church that's no longer salt and light. You can't stop it. In fact, God is going to cause it to deteriorate even faster. But he who escapes is going to come to you. The one who escaped, when they come on that day, your mouth will be opened to him or to her who escaped. And you will speak. And you will be dumb no longer. God bless.